Let's have a look at what happens to a capacitor in a circuit. So this capacitor is fairly large. If you're drawing a circuit and you want to include a source and some load, you probably wouldn't draw it this big, but the capacitor has lines of equal length. And when we think about parallel plates, we'll draw a diagram soon, that makes a little bit more sense. So here on my diagram, I have these blue dots, and these blue dots are electrons, so just E negative. So those electrons bring with it a negative charge. If I think about the direction of current here, I'm going from positive to negative, and so that's going to be my conventional current in this clockwise direction, but the electrons themselves, okay, they're going to be driven in the opposite direction, and they're going to shimmy along this way in this counterclockwise direction. So when I close the switch to complete the circuit, the electrons are going to shimmy in this direction, and they're going to build up on this plate, and more and more electrons are going to build up on this plate, and when all those electrons end up coming in here, we're going to have a large negative charge. Now I also have electrons on the left hand side, and these are also negatively charged, and those like charges are going to repel. So the large amount of electrons on the right is going to push or repel these electrons on the left. Let's take a look. Here in this figure, we can see how this is going to work. So I'm going to crank the voltage up, and the switch is going to be closed. Let's just reset it here. When I close the switch, these electrons are going to accumulate on the right-hand plate, and we can see that the electrons on the left-hand plate are kind of being forced out. Now we have a fixed amount of electrons in the circuit, and so this is going to reach an equilibrium point where we have a large amount of negative charges here, and we have a small amount of negative charges here, or we have some electron holes on the left side of the plate. And that's going to give rise to an electric field, which is going to be represented by these lines. So let's do this again, and we can see that the field lines are increasing, meaning that the strength of that field between the capacitor plates is increasing. And then at some point here, we're going to get saturated. So in this case, I can go up to 10 volts, and we can't force any more electrons into that capacitor. So at this point, the capacitor is charged, and if we think ahead, how do we get that charge back out of the capacitor? How do we do something useful with it? Well, my circuit in this case isn't complete, so to do something useful with it, I could have another circuit up here. I could have some sort of light that I want to flash, so you charge the capacitor, it discharges the light flashes, and then you repeat, so a flashing LED, something like this, and so complete the circuit like this, and then what I'm going to do is with my switch, I can't do it on this slide, but when I break the switch, I now have a new circuit that has been completed, and the extra electrons here can now flow through the LED or the resistor and back round. So when I break the charging circuit, I create a discharging circuit. All right, I'm gonna try my best to sketch here the idea of a parallel plate capacitor. So we need some plates, and we need two of them. So I'm gonna draw a second one here kind of in behind the first one, and I want to connect these to some source. So just like this. Now, the way that I've drawn it here, you can imagine that when you charge up the capacitor, in, the, in this case there's no switch, but when you close that switch to charge up the capacitor, there's my positive, there's my negative, okay? One of these plates is going to become positively charged, 
let's change colors here. This one is going to become positively charged and the right hand plate is going to become negatively charged. Again, the electrons move in this direction and so we will get a lot more electrons on the right hand side or in this case the right hand plate. So fill out a bunch of electrons and I have fewer ones on the left. So there's a few characteristics here that are going to be important for determining how how good our capacitor is, how much capacitance it can actually have. And so one of them is going to be actually how big these plates are. So these plates, I'll give them an area, we'll call it A. And so if you have bigger plates, physically more room for electrons to accumulate, then you're going to be able to have more capacitance. Another factor here is this separation between the plates, this D. So I'll say D for distance, and so if my plates are really close together, I can actually have a better capacitance as long as I can't complete the circuit and have the electrons jump across, then I can have if the plates are really far apart. So using this info, we can write an equation for capacitance, and we can say capital T for capacitance. Well, if I have a bigger area, I get more capacitance, and if I have a smaller distance between them, I get more capacitance. So that inverse relationship with distance goes on the bottom, and I need something else in here. I need a constant. And so this constant is an epsilon zero or an epsilon naught. And that constant is going to maintain my dimensional proportionality. And this thing is called the permittivity of free space. And so E0 equals 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12, so it's super small. And then the units here are farads per meter, F per M. So I'll just jump over to Wikipedia and have a look at this. The page is vacuum permeability. And what it is, I'll just highlight this one term, it's the capability of an electric field to permeate, permeate a vacuum. So you've got that distance between the plates and the electric field needs to be able to go between one plate to the next. And so a vacuum is the base condition and we're going to see some insulating factors that can be replaced in there, that can be placed between the plates and that's going to affect how well that field can travel between those plates. So that's the permittivity of free space. Uh, and here we can see the fundamental constant value times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter. Let's do an example demonstrating how to use this new formula that we have for capacitance. So we've got an area separating the parallel plates and we have a separation gap. So part A, find the capacitance. So I need to know my E naught. So I was just looking at this on Wikipedia. So 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 SI units are farads per meter. So I'll pop that in. And then I have just this proportional relationship area divided by separation distance. So again, making sure everything is in SI units, and it looks like it's already been done for me, two times 10 to the minus four. So you could write the whole thing out like this, or you could write 0.0002. And then D on the bottom 
this is the same as 0 0.001 meters. So maybe I'll mix it up and just put 0 001 meters on there. I haven't written my units in, but that's okay. I'll be sure to put them in when I'm done. Okay, so I've done this calculation and this is going to be 1.77 times 10 to the minus 12 and then I need SI units for capacitance. So in this case, the SI units are farads after Michael Faraday. And that is just going to be a capital F. Uh, now I have a super tiny prefix here, right? Or I have a very, very small number. So times 10 to the minus 12 is actually pico. So we could say that this is also 1.77 little p f for pico farads. So pico is times 10 to the minus 12 as an SI prefix. Let's look at the relationship overall between voltage and charge. So voltage is V, charge is capital Q, so that's adding up all of the smaller charges in the system, which would be uh, lowercase q. And what we can do is we can plot these. So if we plot charge on the vertical, and voltage on the horizontal or the X, we can get a relationship between the two and it'll be approximately a straight line. I don't necessarily know what the slope uh, is in terms of numbers. I'm not going to put numbers on here, but this line now represents, well, the the slope of this line now represents the capacitance. And so I can put this together now into a tidy relationship here. So I can say that capacitance equals Q over V. And it turns out that when I have a graph like this, the area under the graph the area under this curve here actually represents the energy that is stored in that field that arises between the plates. So that's kind of neat and we have a nice new relationship here of Capacitance equals charge divided by voltage. So going back to my example here, now I can follow this up. How much charge, that's Q, is on the positive plate if it's connected to a three volt battery? Obviously that's source voltage V. And I've already calculated the capacitance. So I said that the capacitance is the charge divided by voltage and we can just rearrange this and we can solve now for Q as charge and we can say charge equals capacitance times voltage. So from before I had my charge which turned out to be 1.77 pico or times 10 to the minus 12 farads. Well if we have a 3 volt source we can multiply it by 3. So this comes out to 5.31. Now it's still really tiny, times 10 to the minus 12. But now we have charge, and we have to go back and recall what our units of charge was. So charge was represented as a Coulomb. So this is going to be capital C for Coulombs. And again, that number is super tiny. So this just reminds us that something like a single Coulomb is 
an enormous amount of charge and a single farad is enormous amount of capacitance. So capacitance is often very small. Or the other way to think about this is that one farad is huge. Think back to our examples of capacitors. Most capacitors are physically small and they hold a very small amount of charge. If you want to hold a lot of charge, you need a really big casing, a big cylinder in order to get a large discharge.